Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Well, welcome. We want to welcome everyone to our podcast. It's the National Comadres Network's once a month hosted podcast for the Healing Generations. And uh, we want to thank you as you join us today from around the world, wherever you're at. Thank you for being with us. We know that you are choosing to be with us and we do not take that lightly. So thank you for spending this hour with us and enjoying our guest that we will be interviewing today and having that opportunity and honor to be able to share another story of a woman's life. And without a shadow of a doubt, it's going to be something that you hear that's going to bless your life. And so our, our goal always as the Healing Generation podcast is that healing, that when you hear what you hear today, you will come out just a little bit better than when you started. My name is Deborah Luis Camarillo, and I'm coming to you from Ohlone Territory up in Hayward in the Bay Area. And I'm co-hosting with my comadre, and I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Maestra. Thank you. Susana Armijo, I'm so honored to be here, especially uh, with our special guest today. I am coming to you from the... Angva people, the Gabrielino people here in Los Angeles, California, East LA. It's a beautiful day out there today. Uh, luckily, we were have some sunshine. You know, it's been raining and raining, and um, I know we need that water too, but I, we need that balance. <laughs> I need, we need that light, especially yeah. at this uh, hibernating time of the year. <laughs> so it's, it was beautiful to wake up today and see that Tata Sol up there. Uh, just looking forward to uh, this new year and embracing it. Uh, trying to just remain open and surrender to uh, whatever creator sends our way and uh, asking for those blessings. And like I always say, primero Dios, <laughs> mm. as, as we go forward. Mm-hmm. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. I heard uh, you were rocking and rolling over there early this morning, huh? Oh, yeah. 4.2 over here in uh, the Whittier, California area. It was a little wake-up call. I guess mm. they were just... Uh, Greeting the new year, too, <laughs> with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> a little earthquake, yeah. Glad it didn't get more serious. <laughs> yeah, Great. thanks, Kamala. <laughs> well, you know, we um, we love to be able to share with our audience, right, the many wonderful women that we have the pleasure of crossing paths with. And part of what we try to do is the acknowledgement right? Because we come from so many different places. And to be able to feature and to hear and share stories from women from different parts of, uh, you know, Turtle Island of the United States, and even from abroad. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, as a uh, co-Mexican, right? I I, I always Mm -hmm. say that, right? So my dad is Comanche Mexican blood, and my mother, the Puerto Rican Caribe blood, we would want to extend a blessing, Abimi Rumi, in Arawako, but blessings to all those that come with us because the ancestry that you bring, your heritage, your legacy is so important. And at the end of the day, there's those core values that connect all of us, people, indigenous people from around the world. They all connect us. And this podcast, we're going to be able to be hearing from one of our other sisters from a different part of the United States and uh, coming in with us from Colorado, Denver, Colorado. So we're excited to have her on board with us in in this next hour. So, Comadre, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce her and share her with all of our audience. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Our our Comadre, our hermana, We love her. She is uh, Miss Alma Mirales. She is a proud Mexicana indigenous mujer, a strong mujer, 
a mother of four beautiful children and a grandmother of five. Also a very devoted wife for over 25 years. So that says so much right there. Yes. Uh, very devoted to her familia and her partner. She holds a degree in paralegal studies and is also a certified violence intervention professional, a moral recognition therapy facilitator, a member of the Debt-Free Justice Committee, a member of Hobby, H-A-V-I, a community organizer, a former gang member, but she has also been in recovery for over 16 years. Congratulations. Oh, what an accomplishment. She's an advocate for youth, families, and focuses her work on advocating and supporting our Spanish-speaking community who really need it the most. Such a dedicated mujer. So happy to have you here with us, Alma. Just like to uh, give you a chance to um, come on, introduce yourself, maybe share a little bit about uh, yourself, your familia, your background, and uh, maybe those that uh, you're connected to at this time. Whatever comes from your heart, this is just a plática, a comadreando. Yes that uh, we would like to share with you. So I'm going to pass the palabra to you and uh, whatever you want to share. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Muchas gracias, first of all, to you both, Maestra Deb and Maestra Susie, for thinking of me and considering me. You know, I don't take this lightly, and I, I really honor your invitation and for you to invite me and thinking of me and bringing me into this space and inviting me to share my truth and my story. My name is Alma Mireles. I am a Mexicana indigenous woman from Torreón, Coahuila. I am a, a daughter. I am a wife, I'm a sister. You know, I've been married for 25 years. I met my husband when I was 16 years old. And, you know, we're from rival gangs. So we were not even supposed to be kicking it. <laughs> we were not even supposed to be talking to each other, looking at each other, right? Um, and so, yeah, and, and it's been 25 years. And, you know, we were not supposed to survive or live through a lot of the situations that um, mm. were meant to break us and actually, like, kill us, right? Um, but we're here together holding it down. For ourselves and our family, we have four children. We recently bought our first home. We were homeless at one point in our lives together. We're both recovering drug addicts. We're both former gang members. You know, we have five grandchildren, all of them from our oldest son. So a lot of my lived experiences have really shaped where I am at now in the way that I connect with my community. I'm an outreach worker, so I work a lot with youth, right, in community and with the families. And a lot of the work that I do through the AIM program is hospital-based. So what we do mm -hmm. is whenever one of our young people is shot or stabbed or assaulted, we're basically mm -hmm. there in the emergency department making sure that they receive the medical treatment that they deserve. Because mm. oftentimes our young people who are black and brown are treated as the offenders rather than the victims, right? And that that really gets in the way of, of the way that they receive the medical treatment that they deserve. So we're just there to make sure that they're seen and treated in a dignifying way. Outside of that, you know, we do a lot of outreach work in the community. So this is where I'm at in my life right now. Just doing a lot of outreach work. Like I said, you know, I used to throw down chingadasos for the wrong reasons, right? And I still get down and throw chingadasos, but now it's for the right reasons. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. You know, you have a story, and I think that's so relevant, especially in this day and time, right? Because we have... You know, you hear a lot, especially on social media or even on the news and, you know, issues of, of immigration and just a lot of, of haters out there of things that they might not understand. And thank you for sharing that you, you know, you were born in Torreón, Coahuila mm -hmm. and crossed over. The lines crossed us over, but we're here, right? Yeah. Uh, can you share a little bit, Alma, about that journey, about, you know, what it was like, 
getting to the place and then what really set you up and how did you really get engaged in recovery and in a different way? Mm. Yeah, Maestra, well, thank you. Um, we actually made the journey when I was about five years old because my dad passed away and because mm. my mom had been traveling back and forth from Torreón, Coahuila to Indio, California since the age of 11. She's the oldest of 13. So she had been traveling back and forth since the age of 11 during the summertime to help her family in working in her extended family's um, restaurant. So whatever money she made during the summertime, she would go back to Mexico and that's how she would help provide at the age of 11 and forward help with her younger siblings. So she knew that she had more opportunity as a single mom when my dad passed away. So she made the journey with us. We actually crossed over undocumented. My mom received her visa through the Braceros program in the 80s. And so for us to become legal, it took a long time, right? But she she crossed us over undocumented. So, you know, we had to cross over pretending that we were sleeping. That's all I remember about that. And I just remember that we moved to California and it was a very difficult and scary situation for us. We didn't know the language. You know, we didn't have any family. And, you know, my mom had to work a lot of hours. And in that moment, you know, it was hard for us because we didn't understand why she was gone a lot of the time. But that also, you know, unsupervised children tend to get involved in really bad situations. And that's actually what led me into that gang lifestyle. So through her journey and through that, through the migration journey, you know, I think that this is part of the story that was shaping me, you know? I think that my dad's passing is the real reason as to why I'm here today. And, mm. and you know, I didn't understand it in the beginning, but I honor it now. And I've learned to make peace with the pain of losing him and I honor his sacrifice because I understand the reason why we had to go through all of those struggles. And I think that that's so common and, and it's a misconception, right? Because I think there's an idea out there is, oh, yeah, people just come because they want to come. And that isn't necessarily the truth. There's circumstances and situations, right? right. In order for families to get better, you know, in order for parents, they look and they say, oh, for my child to have a better life or, you know, and these intentions sometimes or the reality of situations sometimes, they kind of get skipped over and then generalized as, oh, they're coming here to take what we have, which we know is furthest from the truth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so how did that set you up, Alma, to get engaged with some of that? Or how did that all happen that you got into recovery and and then actually turning that hard situation into this blessing of serving your community. Well, Maestra, you know, when I was right around my teenage years, my mom really saw that my life was really starting to go into a direction that she really didn't mean for my life to head, right? When she, she made the journey, she actually wanted to better our lives, right? She wanted a life of opportunity you know, mm -hmm. and opportunity wasn't easy for a single mom, right? With limited resources and limited support, it wasn't as easy as she thought it would be. It meant long hours away from your children. It meant, you know, no family support. It meant no government assistance. It meant all of these things she was not prepared to face, right? And so with that came, you know, the realization of, now, as a result of this, I'm seeing the symptoms of these things through my children, my oldest daughter now acting out, ditching school, hanging out with the older gang members. I can't find her in the middle of the night 
you know, me la están escondiendo, estos cholos, you know, like, and that's scary for her, you know, because here she is doing her best, trying to provide, and she doesn't understand why I'm being so rebellious, right? And so her brothers and sisters started to also make the journey. So they came to Denver, Colorado. And so she said, you know what? We're going to go. We're going to reroute. <laughs> Let's rethink this. We're going to reroute. And I think I'll have a better support system with my brothers and sisters. So we came to Colorado. But obviously, you know, I think that whenever someone is dealing with such levels of pain, it's not the environment. It's about what we hold within us, right? And so the location made no difference. And so mm -hmm. the, the same patterns of behavior continued here. And I think this is when the gangs um, started to boom in the 90s in Colorado as well, because a lot of people started to come from California here to Colorado. And so I started to engage in a similar behavior here, and it, it actually began to get worse. I actually left my house and my mom wouldn't know anything about me for months, you know, and that's when I started to really experiment with harder drugs. She wouldn't know anything about me, you know, for months, days, weeks, for a long time, you know, and sometimes I would only come home just to crash because I really needed that moment in time, those days to just crash, right? Shower, sleep, eat, and then go back. So... Those were the only times that she would get to see me. And then I met my husband when I was about 16 years old in the streets. You know, I, I was visiting my mom at that time and, and I met him while I was visiting her and, and he was living the similar lifestyle. And, you know, we really connected in that way. And I just really felt that he was someone that I had never experienced to be so caring and, and interested in me. And I became pregnant by him shortly after. And then we both were engaging in similar behavior. But then our son was born and then we were both homeless, staying in a car, you know, getting kicked out of places. And it was rough. It was very rough, but it was very real. And then, you know, our son was born into this dysfunctional relationship and dysfunctional family setting. And I think that that's, that's the reason that I connect so well with a lot of the families and community, because I understand that pain, you know. In my previous place of employment, I received a lot of clinical training where, you know, they say, you know, it's, it's mental health, trauma-informed, culturally rooted, you know. But when you really ask someone, explain that to me, what does that even look like? Even if they're facing it, they can't describe it, you know? And I think that those experiences for me, having survived those experiences allows me to see the soul of my clients, you know, to really feel that pain because I've been there, you know? And this is what I tell my clients, you know, I can be like your, your downest advocate, but I'll also be your worst enemy because I will call you out on your shit you mm -hmm. can bullshit a bullshitter you know and I'm not here to to sugarcoat nothing I'm here because I love you and I care about you if hope is there for me it is there for you nothing makes me special I'm not more special than you this is something that we can both get through together so I think that this is the reason why I had to live through all of these things so so that I can actually see it and feel it and acknowledge it. And whenever I'm facing it, I can recognize it and really feel it. You know, like, I don't know how to describe it in words. I can only tell you that when I see someone, I know it. I recognize it. And this is the reason why I, I do what I do so passionately. And this is the reason why, you know, I love to work in the community that I serve. because. I feel that a lot of people can glorify or, or, you know, romanticize the idea of becoming heroes or, or saviors, but we're not here to save anyone. We're here to walk with them on their journey. We're just here to say, hey, you're not alone. 
I've been through here. I've been through here, you know? Mm -hmm. I can walk with you, but I can't walk for you. Wow. They're so fortunate well, to, to have you put in their path and, and as well as all those people that were put in your path, you know, at the right time. I can't even imagine what that chapter was for you, you know, growing up and, and getting pregnant early and being in that environment and then trying to work it out with your husband and, and being homeless like only you you guys understand what that was like. We can, we can only imagine. But, you know, there's something that, that we were so blessed to be in each other's presence um, during our, our Gira Sol training with Maestra and you and um, the other mujeres. And there is something that you shared there that just really sticks with me. And I guess because it's such a big issue right now for our youth. And, and that's the bullying in school. And uh, and I know you're familiar with some of the things that happened to me. That, that were words that were shared that was very hurtful and soul-breaking. Um, and then having to rise from the ashes of that. I know it's happened to you. We see each other in that way. Uh, I was wondering if maybe you could help explain from your perspective and, and your own journey some teachings about that, not not just as the one being bullied or, or you bullying somebody else out of your own wounds, you know, um, trying to survive and, and whatever that is. Maybe you can shed some light to help us understand what our youth are going through, what that feels like uh, from both sides, to be the bullier or to be the, the one being bullied. Yeah, you know, just recently, one of my daughters, who's 15, was in a situation where she was in school and she had been targeted by two sisters, one of them being a senior in high school, my daughter's a freshman, and the youngest sister being a freshman as well, and both sisters physically assaulting her and her having to defend herself, but as a result of defending herself, also facing the disciplinary actions that come from defending herself and the school calling it a fight, right? And me having to face being presented with, do I press criminal charges on the oldest sister? You know, and I, I remember having the meeting with the principal and being very clear. And I said, you know what? That is not an option for me. And I will tell you the reason why. I fight against these systems every single day of my life. And I'm put in this position where my child has been victimized in a way where she has been physically assaulted and has defended herself, right? Mm -hmm. And I have two girls who have this pain inside of them who feel that it is their right to hurt someone else. And the only option that feels like it's the only correct option at this point is the criminal charges. I fight against these systems. So this is not an option for me right now. So I'm in a tough situation, but I'm still against this, right? And so mm -hmm. what we've done in this situation is be present in that school, create healing circles in that school, making sure that my daughter and her group of friends who have felt hurt by that school and the administrators feel validated. They feel safe when they go into that school, right? Making sure that as much as these administrators have taken the disciplinary action against my daughter and our group of friends and these other two girls, you know, that they also hold themselves accountable for the lack of acknowledgement that they've lacked to present to these girls, right? And so they've mm -hmm. also lacked, they failed to create a safe space for these girls and for the whole school. So, you know, I've been very intentional about the way that I proceeded, you know, because I know that the way that I showed up had to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. It had to bring healing, not just for my daughter. You know, I was pissed off. Like, if it would have been back in the day, I would have, let me tell you, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, you know? <laughs> right. But we're in a different place. And it's about it's about transformational healing, you know? Yes. And I understand that. And it's about bringing collective healing, 
not just for my daughter, mm -hmm. but for the whole school and for the students to come after my daughter, you know? And I made mm -hmm. sure that I told them, this school is not just a school. You might have to drive miles to get here. My suegros have been living here for over 25 years. There's generations of my family that have been coming to the school for years. This is not just one school. This is part of who we are. And this is the reason why we protect it. It's more than just mm -hmm. this fight, you know? And mm -hmm. so that is the approach that I took for that, you know? But I just think that it's, it's very important that we acknowledge that when we hold all this level of unhealed pain, you know, it does come out in a, an aggressive way, in a way that, you know, it doesn't serve us or, and it doesn't serve others, you know? Mm -hmm. I also extended an invitation to the school. I said, I can't work with these two students that assaulted my daughter because I would be a conflict of interest. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But let me connect these two girls to other community resources that I know are here, you know, mm -hmm. um, that can also help them. So I did that also, you know, because it's about how are these girls going to show up in our community because they are part of our community and our community is part of our family. You know, it's not just the school. Yes. Right. Well, you know, that that's a, a very important point, right? So you talked about a cultural intervention, which is the circulo, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and I remember doing some work because these are traditional ways that we would come together and resolve issues or celebrate issues. And I remember I was working in a local high school in San Francisco that had so many fights, especially lunch. Everybody's fighting, right? And so we took some drums. Mm -hmm. And so every day for lunch, you know, I would set up a circle of drums. And at that time, my brother was working with me. And we would just sit there and play the drums. And anybody who wanted to play the drums could come and sit down in front of a, of a drum and join us in, in the drum circle. And so at first when we went there, they were like, what the heck? What are you guys doing? What are I said, join us. You know, we didn't say, don't do this or don't come on in an invitation. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, those rhythms that beat deep inside of our DNA, right, started to regulate the environment and that vibration started to go out. Well, let me tell you, when we finished there, the lunchtime didn't have no more fights. You know, people were actually laughing and you can hear people playing around and they wanted, where's the drum circle? You know, mm -hmm. and I just bring that up because it's a cultural intervention. There are things that we did with each other that sometimes we forget are so powerful, like dance, you know? Right. And so I'm wondering, I'm not, what other cultural things do you do and how do you integrate culture, cultura, into the work that you do with your youth and your families? What are some of those things and what are some of those outcomes? You know, it's the community engagement, you know, the girls and the boys that I'm working with, you know, reconnecting them to the land. There was recently an activity that we completed in community at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal Refuge where we actually collected the semillas from the girasoles, right? And we're going to be offering them back in the springtime, you know, giving them back to the land, but also the archery. So they, they actually completed two different activities during that day. And just like educating them about the girasol and, and the cultural relevance and the, the significance of it culturally for us, right? And the boys paying attention as much as the girls, it was very beautiful and powerful. So just taking every single moment in every single space in community, we tend to believe that it has to be very difficult or it has to be very mystical. It doesn't, you know, we're people of spirituality. We're people of prayer and connection and relationship. And I just think that every single moment is a teaching moment. And so every moment that I'm blessed and honored to spend with my youth or my families, just last night, I spent over an hour, you know, praying with one of the moms that I'm working with. You know, we had court this afternoon. So during the training, I had to 
kind of disconnect a little bit so I can actually hop on Zoom for a, for the hearing. But last night I had to, after the training, I had to like pray with her for, for almost an hour, you know, because we knew that today was going to be a very big and important day. And, you know, letting her know, you know, we've done everything we can. We've implemented all the services that we could humanly put in place. We just got to let creator do his job. We have to trust that there's a greater purpose and a greater plan. And we need to let that plan unfold. You know, human power is human and it's attached to this. We need to let the divine intervention take its course. You know, and I think that's the reason why actually the hearing went very smooth this afternoon, because before then she just wasn't in a good place, you know, but it's it's also like connecting her with, you know, I understand you as a mom, but I've also been there as him as a juvenile, you know, and I, I understand your pain because my mom has been through that pain of not knowing, being so uncertain, right? And being so frustrated because you want a different outcome, but then your child is not making the right choices for that outcome to happen, you know? And it's Mm -hmm. out of your control. You just have to trust that divine intervention will do its job, you know? And I told her, you know, I'm living proof of that. Just believe and trust because there's a greater purpose. There is a greater purpose. You know, and so this is how I work with my families. Every single moment, I really make sure that that I stay connected to everything that has actually helped me through the toughest moments of my life, which is prayer, connection, silence, reflection, right? It's just the simplest things. I used to call it isolation. Now I call it coming back to spirit. I understand it now. There's, there's a difference. Right, right. Powerful. Divine intervention. So, so true. And for those of us who have been blessed to, to be divinely guided at the right time, at the right place. So, you know, you say that and in reading your bio, the thing that really spoke to my soul was, was your miraculous divine intervention of being able to be in recovery for 16 years. You know, I can't imagine how that what it took for you to get there? What was that moment that just was the turning point? And and I guess it, it really speaks to my heart because unfortunately I lost two of my brothers to, to a meth addiction and a, a lot of family members through the years, a lot of friends. Sometimes you always think like, like love will fix it. <laughs> like if you love them up enough, you know, they'll, they'll pull through. And, um, you know, it, it's right when you talk about these choices. We're all blessed with the same gift of being able to choose and uh, choose what's best. I guess what I'm curious to know from you, for your, on your own journey, your own experience with with addiction, what was that turning point for you? And uh, maybe just share for others that may be struggling with that, you know, those palabras of hope for recovery and not giving up going forward. Well, you know, Maestra, just as I mentioned earlier, you know, when my mom made the journey to California as a single mom, we were left alone for very long periods of time, right? And I didn't understand. You know, I just I just felt alone and abandoned for a long time, you know? And so I held a lot of resentment against her, mostly because there was a lot of really bad things that happened to me when she was gone, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I became a mom, I was already doing drugs and, you know, my son was actually tested for drugs. I remember that they they placed a little plastic bag on his penis. You know, he was less than 24 hours old. So, you know, for me, I still live with that. You know, he dropped his first UA before he was 24 hours old, you know, and, and I live with that, you know, and that still didn't change me, you know. We still had to go through more struggles and and challenges. And, you know, we talk about a rock bottom. And sometimes that rock bottom still finds another rock bottom, you know. And there was a moment of my life where I remember my son was eight years old. And I was getting ready to leave for a weekend of partying. And my son was asking me, 
Ama, ama, are you going to go out again? You know, and I, I wouldn't turn back to see him because I was too busy looking at myself. You know, I was like trying to like, oh, okay, I got to go. I got to go. Right. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, Amma, Amma, are you going to go? And yes, yes. Like, you know, why are you, why do you keep asking me? Like, it, it was just, it was bothering me. And he just went silent. And that silence was just kind of a different type of silence for me. And when I look back to see my son, and he looked up, the look on his eyes, I could see the sadness and abandonment that I felt as a kid. I recognized mm -hmm. it. I felt it. The only difference was that I was the one causing it. It was no longer my mom. Mm -hmm. And so for mm -hmm. me, something just clicked. I call that my divine intervention. I call mm -hmm. that my divine intervention. God spoke mm -hmm. to me through my son's eyes, you know, because I understood that moment. That was a very critical moment of my life. That was a life changing yes. moment. If I wouldn't have looked back in that moment, I don't know if I would still be here or alive or if I still would have had my kids with me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that is the moment of my life that defined the reason why I'm here right now. Because I understood that that level of sadness and abandonment. I understood that what I was creating and because where I found myself in life in that moment, I understood where my son was heading. Mm -hmm. And so I decided not to go out that night. And it was one of the hardest decisions that I had to make. And I remember as I continued to stay away from people and not go out and seek this and the, the high levels of anxiety because nobody understands unless you've been there especially being a Mexicana, right? Like, you know, like you don't hear about this culturally. And I just, when I look back, I just remember the, the moments of when I would have the cravings and the anxiety and being in, on my bed and tossing and turning and just, you know, hating myself and asking God, why me? Why can't I be normal? Right. And just like literally praying and pleading, let this be over. I don't like feeling like this, you know. So it was really hard. I can't say that it's not. But what kept me going is understanding that in that moment, I knew where my son's life was heading and I didn't want that for him. And I think that the biggest motivator for me have always been my children. Because I understand that my purpose is bigger than I can even understand or process. And although I know that I have a mission here, I'm still in the process of fully grasping that mission, right? So I love doing what I do. I give fully of myself with a full heart and intention. But I can't tell you that this is it for me. I know that there is more for me to learn and grow and give. And, you know, I feel that the reason why we go through these things, this is why we earn our stripes, is because there's still soldiers in the battlefield, right, who feel that they're not understood or that other people don't really understand them or they don't really, you know, people don't really understand or see them. And then there's people like us who say, hey, tú eres mi otro yo. Yo te veo, mm -hmm. yo te siento. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Melissa. I appreciate Beautiful. your transparency and just being so willing to be vulnerable and honest and authentic. We need to know this. We need to yes. to know how it is to understand how we can continue supporting. Yes, yes. Gracias a you all. You're here. Such a blessing. And the truth of it, right? Because it is a difficult journey. It is a difficult journey. You know, I've often said, 
When you come into recovery on this healing path, it's the hardest journey you will ever embark on. And I'm, I just want to thank you, Mia, for um, sharing that because I know that there's other women out there, there's mujeres out there, there's our sisters out there that are struggling. They're in that position. I remember my own life and being in that position and crying out and saying, man, I need help because I can't do it. And you don't know what to do. But the mere fact that you're here, that I'm here, there's others here that today are able to live a different life. That is the vision, right? That is the hope that anyone on this path, they can also change their lives. And so, you know, if you're struggling out there today, if you're a mom out there today, and if you find yourself you know, using and trying to stop using or stop drinking, and you feel that you haven't been able to get out of it, even though you want to, let us encourage you today. There is a way out. There's people in your community that want to help you. And it's a lie to say, once a dolphine, always a dolphin. It's a lie to say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Because we are living testimonies that that can be broken and healing can come into your life. So thank you. And we don't want our moms too, because I know working with moms, it's so easy to get consumed with the guilt, right? Yes. But if we can remember, it's the way that we deal with pain. There's no one that's born that says, you know what? I want to grow up to be a dauphine. I want to grow up to be an alcoholic. I want to go grow up to go to print. No, we don't. It's life circumstances and the pain and the way that we deal with pain. You know, addiction is all about dealing with pain. And with that, Alma, I want to ask you, you work with youth, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what would those consejos be that you could give to our little youngsters out there? And also to the women, to the mujeres, to our sisters out there. What consejos can you give them or would you like to give them of encouragement? You know, whenever I enter a space, I don't enter with extra letters after my last name. I don't hold all these fancy degrees or, you know, I enter with my name, my last name and my lineage. That's who I enter and that's how I enter, right? I enter with intention. I enter with a full heart and something that I learned early on from one of my mentors is, you know, we don't connect with people through accreditation. We connect with people through our stories and our pain and our struggle. And so as long as we keep that in mind, that we are all connected through our stories, through our humanity through our sacredness, through our spirit, we can all make it through. And that we all hold the medicine within us. And it is our duty and our obligation to share it and also to receive it from others, right? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. for me, what I received from my son in that moment was clarity, was clarity. And he didn't know that he was doing it. But he did it, and all it took was intention. And I just think that we all hold the medicine, and and we just have to be very, very mindful about receiving it and be willing to receive it, right? Because sometimes Mm -hmm. we think that, well, I'm not going to listen to you because who are you? You're not an expert. None of us are an expert at anything, (laughs) at anything, right? Um, We're only Mm -hmm. here to pretty much comfort each other and help each other through this journey. That is all we're here for. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would just share with other people, you know, and your story is worth sharing and it's worth telling and you matter and I matter and we all matter. And I've learned so much from different people and, you know, something that I also hold very dearly to me is something that one of my friends told me you got to show people the money 
and me not being a materialistic person is like, not a fool. What do you mean I got to show people the money? I'm not a millionaire. What the hell? You know, he's all like, think about it, you know? And what that means to me is like, my lifestyle is what is going to let people see what they want to achieve, right? So if I'm speaking to a young person and say, you can actually make it out, you can actually live a different life. My lifestyle needs to reflect that. I have to be able to live what I tell them, not just in their presence, outside of their presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My lifestyle needs to be reflective in everything that I do. So Mm -hmm. that's the consejo. If you're going to be talking about it, you better be down with it. Be about it. Uh Thank you, Mija. Yeah, so uh, that's what we say, right? Practice what you preach. <laughs> Live the teachings, right? Or don't share them. Well, you know, it has been such a pleasure to sit with you and such wonderful words of healing and, and inspiration. And, uh, you know, we're so grateful for you um, taking your time. And I know you're you're later than we are, you know, so I know it's <laughs> late for you. But uh, thank you for spending this this time with us. And I'm just wondering, do you have any last words? Well, I just really want to thank you both for inviting me and for seeing me. I want to be intentional and acknowledge you. You know, we, we had the altar this afternoon during our training. And, you know, I brought my medicine bag that I created with both of you over the fall during our Hidasol training. And I said, mm-hmm. you know, I want to be intentional about bringing this uh, medicine bag because I want to acknowledge Maestra Deb and Maestra Susie for Mm. being mujeres de palabra and being mujeres that are paving the way for younger mujeres like myself, you know, and teaching us and guiding us in a good way and, you know, acknowledging us and seeing us, you know, because I felt in the past, you know, disposable. I didn't Mm. matter. And thank you. Thank you both for being the light, the guidance, the girasol, the semillas, Mm. las raíces, Mm. el tambor, el aire, el fuego, la lluvia, la luna. I appreciate Mm. you both. And Mm. so I'm, I'm really honored and I really appreciate you both for extending the invitation and thinking of me and, and creating the space for for these platicas that really does help our community. Oh, thank you. Thank you thank for you. that. Comadre, would you? And la catch. <laughs> you are my other Mimi. I love you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, we're always here to support you in any way that we can and um, want to continue walking with you and, and providing for you in, in, in any way that we can support in any realm, professionally, personally, whatever that is, I, please tuck that away into your corazón, your big corazón there, and, and just know you are a, a divine intervention for more people than you'll ever realize, and especially for us. Gracias. Thank you, Mia. Adelante. Yes, yes, and thank you. And, you know, part of what we teach when we talk about, you know, indigenous teachings is that we honor all our relations. And I just want to take a minute right here uh, right before the end of the year, I lost uh, my dog for that I had for 15 years, named Quetzin Bahaku, and we honor all those relations. And I want to offer that up to everyone hearing that, because her name means it's Nawat. Uh, that means uh, Quetzin is Nawat for beautiful. Bahaku is Taino or uh, Arawaka. That means morning light. So it means beautiful morning light. And I just want to offer to all those that are listening, you might be going through so many difficult things, but remember in the morning, there will always be a beautiful morning light. The darkness does not last forever. And so my year is dedicated to that in her honor and remembrance. And I just want to share it with all of our listeners. So with that, I just want to thank you. Thank you for joining us. On Healing Generations, the hosted one by uh, the National Comadres Network. We're so grateful, Alma, for being with us today. 
and uh, bendiciones and blessings to your work over there in Denver, Colorado, and to your youth and your families um, as you continue to lead with your co-workers that work out there. And also uh, to remind those that are hearing, um, if you go online, uh, National Comadres, under the National Compadres Network, their uh, webpage, you will find the activities that we have. We have a virtual circle that happens every month. We have newsletters that go out. There's other podcasts on Healing Generations and a wealth of information there. So we encourage you, if you want to stay connected, that's the place to go, plus our social media. And so you're welcome to be engaged in that way. So with that being said, we're going to be signing off. And so, you know, bendiciones over here from Hayward, California. And this is Deborah Luis Camarillo saying thank you for joining us and bendiciones as you continue to go on. And comadre. It's an armijo. Gracias a todos. God bless you with this new journey as we enter into this new year and uh, keep going forward. Primero Dios. And our guest. Muchas gracias a todos. Bendiciones. Feliz Año Nuevo. Keep doing your best because that's the best we can do. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, Mateo. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.